Hello, this is Deborah Anderson, the Black Woman Animator, coming back to you with another video. And in this video, I have Monique Henry Hudson. Welcome. Hi. I was like, do I talk yet? Do I not talk? <laughs> <laughs> so do a little 20 to 30 second intro of your, your role in the animation industry, who you are. Oh, sure. Yeah. So again, my name is Monique Henry Hudson. Um, I'm going to lead with, you know, how I would like to continue to be recognized as a filmmaker. Um, I'm a podcast host, co-founder of Diverse Tunes, and then I work professionally as a production coordinator on feature animation. Mm -hmm. yeah. So if you ride and die, Black woman animator, you've seen Monique before. Oh, right. <laughs> some live video, so she won't be new to some people. All right. So first question, where are you from and how was it growing up? Okay, so I am born and raised in New York City, specifically Queens. I like to specify that because, you know, the way that we are in New York is like mm -hmm. each borough, well, New York City, each borough is different mm -hmm. and we kind of don't claim the rest of the state. That's <laughs> just what it is. Anything outside of New York City is upstate. <laughs> basically, literally, basically. Um, when I was working at Blue Sky, that was actually the farthest north I've ever been. Like I was that cliche never been farther than the Bronx type of person mm -hmm. <laughs> up until then. Um, what was it like growing up in New York? One thing that really sticks out to me was, was the whole um, 50 Cent and Ja Rule <laughs> beef because they're both from Queens and mm -hmm. their uh, tension, if you will, definitely was felt in middle school and high school. People were definitely taking sides. Um, I remember, uh, I guess you could say like six years ago, I was working in this indie movie theater in the city mm -hmm. and this kid who was from the Midwest, he was like, so were gangs like a real thing here? I was like, yes, for, for a while. Like even I got to uh, um, experience gang activities from a distance. I got to mm -hmm. see, unfortunately, like gang members coming up to the schools. Mm -hmm. But I feel like by the time I was graduating high school, a lot of that was starting to simmer down. Mm -hmm. If people were being moved because of their families or being locked up, a lot of that had stopped. But that's something that's like very pivotal to like my growing up in New York City experience, mm -hmm. as well as, you know, taking the subway basically all my life the buses. Um, in college, I was in the city more because I went to school in Manhattan. And mm -hmm. so you're seeing celebrities on the street and eventually you do get like numb to it. But one time I really wish I said something to this one singer, but I tweeted her. I was like, I swear I saw you on like 6th and 23rd. And she was like, yeah, you did. That was me. And I was like, oh, I should have said something. <laughs> Not that I wanted your autograph, but like I really <laughs> loved her. So I just wanted yeah. to say hi, you know? I was mm -hmm. like, dang. But yeah, that happens. Like I've seen, um, what's his face, Q-Tip before. Like mm -hmm. he was just chilling, literally sitting down on the curb in like Soho. And I looked at him and he looked at me like, yes, it is me. Like, please. <laughs> and I was like, in my head, I'm like, I wasn't going to say nothing to you because I don't even know what I was saying. But like those type of things. Um, yeah. Yeah. And then also because I'm from New York, like all the touristy stuff, I kind of been there, done that, like before I was even like 18 mm -hmm. so a, a lot of uh that was just like became old to me very quickly so yeah mm -hmm. so like I went to uh, school college in upstate New York and I remember well I don't exactly remember what I thought of New York City and then the boroughs I definitely did not understand that the boroughs made up New York City. I can tell you that. <laughs> okay. I don't know what I thought. I feel like maybe I thought New York, it was like New York City and then all the boroughs. I don't know. Yeah. But I learned, and because I went to, you know, upstate New York, you go to school with a bunch of people from New York City. I'm like, oh, okay. I'm glad I never articulated that out loud. Oh, I yeah. Thought it sounded stupid. <laughs> <laughs> you would have gotten side eye a little bit, but I'm sure someone probably from Queens would have made you feel fine about that. <laughs> And then um, with y'all like taking the subway all the time, like some of my friends didn't get their driver's license until they was like 25. <laughs> yeah. You know, people are quite surprised that I have my driver's license because they're mm -hmm. like, why don't you drive? And I'm like, whose car am I going to drive? Like, I unfortunately could not afford to get a car. Uh -huh. And I'm like, anyone's going to let me drive their car? But like, 
my license is actually about to expire. And they're like, what? You had it that long? I'm like, what am I supposed to do? Just like wear it? Like, so everybody knows? Like, I, you know, whatever. So. Uh -huh. so what are some of your best childhood memories? Oh, well, to just go back to the subway part a little bit, like my mom used to always try and make the subway experience like a joyful one. So mm -hmm. she would always get me like a chocolate bar whenever we had to take the train. Mm -hmm. And um, there was sometimes my dad, which is a really long train ride, but we would, or did we take it from Queens? Probably not. We probably took the train in Brooklyn, but to Coney Island. Mm -hmm. So there's parts of the subway, which is above ground. You're going over the bridges. It's very scenic. Um, I liked a lot of that. Um, I also, I don't want to say this, doesn't matter. Very close uh, family oriented. Mm -hmm. So we would often go to Times Square just to like, my. we were kids. They just mm -hmm. would take us to like the Toys R Us store mm -hmm. and just like sightsee. When it was Christmas time, that was a great time. They used to just drive around the city. Mm -hmm. um, also, a lot of... The, circuses which i've grown to learn are horrible but like yeah. really really loved you know that whole like experience of childhood but um to bring it back to this one of the great things about childhood was really like cartoons for me mm -hmm. so i was one of the fortunate people to like grow up with cable access so i had more than just like pbs shows right. um yeah when things were just starting on cartoon network and like nickelodeon whatever disney I got to see a lot of that in real time. That was mm -hmm. great. And to the point where like my mom, as a form of like babysitting when I was really small, used to record the Saturday morning cartoons and then just play them throughout the throughout the week. Um, which now it's like, well, we have streaming. So I could kind of do yeah. that, right? Nurture my inner child in that way. Mm -hmm. um, so sometimes I even found recently, like on Saturday mornings, I would go into whatever streaming app and like watch some nostalgic cartoons. And I was like, wow, I feel really like I'm going back in time. I'm in my 30s yeah. up on a Saturday morning because like I'm an adult now. I can't sleep in late. So mm -hmm. it's eight o'clock Saturday and I'm like watching Pepper Ann or I'm like watching <laughs> Static Shock. And I was like, I'm doing like a, a loop here. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so what was your... Um... Well, like, what is your uh, cultural makeup and what are you, what are your favorite, maybe, I don't know if you have this customs or traditions from your culture? Cultural makeup, meaning like, where's my family from? Mm -hmm. Cool. And then you said favorite things from my culture? Yeah. Okay, cool, cool. I'm going to make sure I'm answering correctly. So mm -hmm. um, my father is Black American and they have some indigenous heritage within that. Mm -hmm. I believe my great grandmother is like, I would say maybe at least half Native American, completely mm -hmm. not sure, but I seen the pictures. So I was like, I could see it right there. Mm -hmm. um, and then on my mother's side, she is uh, Venezuelan and Trinidadian. Mm -hmm. And once we start going deeper into that family heritage, you can see my grandma on my mom's side is like, <laughs> like white passing, you know? Mm -hmm. And then if we go to my, grandpa on my father's side he's very 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 dark skin and mm -hmm. he has some more like um indian heritage within that venezuelan over there mm -hmm. um and so that's that's my family and <laughs> i always kind of joke and say like i'm diet black well <laughs> i only say that because i didn't really grow up with like the american experience 100 percent Mm -hmm. Um, my parents separated when I was very young. So like I got to be around my black American family, like on weekends, mm -hmm. I lived in a house with a West Indian Hispanic lady. Yeah. So, <laughs> I did not like, I didn't grow up basically with like fabuloso and like pine salt. We grew up with like a different things. And like, I'm learning that like people, even in school were asking me like where I'm from. And I'm like, I'm from Queens. Like, why are you asking <laughs> me where I'm from? But it's because some of the things that I was mentioning, like cream versus lotion and mm -hmm. whatever stuff my mom used to shop at, like sometimes the Spanish bodegas. So mm -hmm. I would be mentioning things and they're like, Wait, like, why would you, why are you bringing this up for? And I was like, okay, well, whatever. <laughs> um, but as far as like some things I just love about the culture, I immediately just think about food. Like mm -hmm. every time I would go over to my grandma's place on my dad's side, it was like collard greens, like mac and cheese 
They mm-hmm. had chitlins. I would not mess with that. <laughs> But they were really into like pickles and I like love pickles and pork rinds, like a whole bunch of Southern stuff. Mm -hmm. And then my mom's side's all about like curry and Mm -hmm. like um, Venezuelans make arepas. Mm, It's almost like a a cousin of a dumpling. Um, So I really, really like that too. And there's some other stuff that I don't know the words of, um, but I'm very big on like curry. And there's some other things that could sound a little gross but (laughs) you know it's like your culture and and yeah you like it I like I learned too like uh Trinidadians make okra differently like Mm -hmm. they blend it so it's almost you could think of like how you have like a spinach dip yeah so you do that instead like over rice or over baked macaroni whereas like Jamaicans and I believe people from the south like fry it Mm -hmm. so I've never really had it like that but mm-hmm. I'm like, if y'all had churny okra, y'all would probably think it's disgusting. And I wouldn't blame you because if I wasn't born eating it, I probably would not be interested. Mm-hmm. Um, so, and then second is music, you know? Like I love various Spanish music. I was fortunate enough to like be in South America at the time when like reggaeton was like starting to boom nice. and blossom. So that was really dope. Mm-hmm. And um, how can you not, if you're a West Indian, love soca music? I don't know. I don't have the stamina for carnival or mm-hmm. like I'm very anxious. I cannot do large crowds, yeah. but I still want to be in a costume one year and just do it. And then like, of course, like a black American culture. Like I just mm-hmm. love that. I'm happy that I could, I have so many parts of like my being is like attached to all these different cultures. Mm-hmm. Uh, what's funny is that uh, I have a twin brother who's a comedian and, when we were in college, um, he used to have a joke where he called himself Diet Black, but his was like, because he was kind of white. <laughs> <laughs> so that was hilarious that you mentioned Diet Black. Yeah, well, I could relate to him on that too, but we'll cross that bridge later. <laughs> so what was your journey with art and animation during your childhood? Oh, so like... I would like to think like many kids, I drew a lot. And I would just say that I was just very fortunate that like actually my mom, when she was pregnant with me, she was at FIT, which is a fashion institute and technology. And mm-hmm. she was doing like interior design there. So she had a lot of respect for the arts. So she basically just like nurtured me. Mm-hmm. And because I was like a daddy's girl, <laughs> Anything that I wanted to explore, like my dad just got me toys or whatever to coincide with it. Like I wanted to be a pediatrician. He got me like a stethoscope and like a doctor's toy kit or whatever. Mm -hmm. I wanted to like be a weather person. They got me like science books. Like, you know, but that's what kids do. They say things. And, you know, if you have parents that really support that, it's like really, really dope. And I've learned not to like take that for granted at all. Mm -hmm. So um, it was like in eighth grade we go to this class trip to the Museum of Moving Image, which is in Queens. Mm -hmm. And um, they had this like station where if anyone's familiar with Madeline, right? Hopefully you read kids books. (laughs) She, they had like a a station with some puzzle pieces of of Madeline and you basically create stop motion stuff. Mm -hmm. So leading up to that point, I was really into like computers. And now I understand you would say like computer science and like IT stuff. I was always like a person that would tinker with gadgets and take electronics apart. Mm -hmm. My mom wouldn't like that (laughs) with good reason. So having that experience, I was like, oh, look, I could bring like computer stuff because we're using a computer to do this. And like the art stuff, because I never really stopped drawing from a a child. I was just trying to like find my way. Mm -hmm. So when I came home and told my parents after that trip, like, I think this is what I want to do. My mom like immediately was like looking around high schools in Queens that had art programs that had some sort of computer art programs. Mm -hmm. Um, They put me, I ended up getting into that high school. I did like summer art classes at different museums around the city. I did weekend and after school classes too, Mm -hmm. all so that I could get into like an art college. And um, I'm probably going a little too far, but just to go back to childhood is this, my parents nurtured my creativity and just whatever I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. Nice. Um, So 
we're going to get into the projects that you've uh, worked on and then get it more into your career. Oh, cool. So your IMDb only has like blue sky stuff. So you're going to have to tell me any more stuff that you can talk about. Yeah. <laughs> so Ice Age Collision Course, uh, Ferdinand, Spies in the Skies, and then you take it from there. <laughs> yes. So, right. I graduated college and then for about four years did so many odd jobs, you know, like I worked at a shoe store, I worked at the movie theater, interned for a film festival, did like fashion week, was like street team walking across Brooklyn Bridge, handing out stuff. I was doing like it all. I think I, yeah, I did a couple more retail too outside of that. I was like a greeter <laughs> at this like luxury store in, in Fifth Avenue, whatever. And then with all of that, though, I was constantly like showing up at recruiting events and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Long story short, I ended up getting at getting in at Blue Sky. And uh, while I was there, I came on to work on Ice Age 5, aka Ice Age Collision Course. Mm -hmm. um, and by the time I got hired, I was like, Ice Age 5? <laughs> I was like, I was only aware of two Ice Ages. So I was like, oh, okay. Um, so yeah, so I, we were working on that. And I came on at the end of that film. And basically the department um, does like a quality check on each frame as they're about to like say, this is good. This is like ready for, you know, make its way to a movie theater. Mm -hmm. And then um, there was an opportunity. That job was only temporary. I think it was like three months. And they were like, well, if you want to stay at the studio, here's some other um, production assistant opportunities in different departments. Ended up moving to story, which opened my eyes because I'm a trained 3D animator and mm -hmm. I thought I really wanted to stay as close to the animation department as possible. But it was like stay and be in like a pre-production department or try and wait it out. But you can no longer have a job after like four years trying to break it in. Right. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm on Ice Age and I'm in I'm in story for actually Spies at the Skies at this point. So. I was like not the main production assistant on Ferdinand, but I helped support Ferdinand when needed. Mm -hmm. So throughout those three movies, I got to experience essentially the beginning, middle, and end working in the story department of a film, but I haven't worked on like one film all the way through. Mm -hmm. So I was at Blue Sky for a, a, a very short time, but felt like a long time. And I was pretty confident that like, okay, well, I have this industry experience. I was commuting from Queens to Connecticut, which was mm -hmm. a very hard commute, but like, it was like my dream job. It's like, I, yeah. I can do this. But I, after like, you know, two years, I took it as like, if I cannot move any closer to the studio one, because of my salary and like student debt, and you mm -hmm. know, I can't make it work financially. I don't know physically how long I could keep up this commute because for those of you who may not know, commuting from Queens, New York City to Connecticut was at least three hours one way on public transportation. Mm -hmm. So you're doing your eight hours a day, you're commuting six hours. That doesn't really give you much time to like eat, rest, and then get yeah. ready or, or do anything else in the meantime. And then God help you if it was like raining or snowing and there were delays on anything, my whole commute will go out the window. So mm -hmm. I was like, I'm going to physically like break down. I don't want to have a nervous breakdown, but my body is like, I can't, I can't keep this up, you know? Right. So, um, yeah, I thought finding a job after Blue Sky would have been so much easier, but yeah. like it, it wasn't. I think I left spring 2018 and then I ended up getting hired at Netflix fall, like fourth quarter 2019. And you can mm -hmm. say like, oh, that's not so bad. But like I was getting interviews for places, um, places predominantly in California. And then they were in TV and they were like, oh, well, you have feature experience, feature, you know, it's kind of slower. Um, mm -hmm. It's quicker. We need someone, one, who's already here, um, two, who we who could just fall in line with stuff. So it it did suck, like getting the interviews, but nothing's really coming from it. And then the people that were like here in New York, <laughs> I even had one job for a day. Like it was actually a little <laughs> blow to my ego because I wanted to work for the studio mm -hmm. in those four years that I was trying to get to Blue Sky. 
and they didn't pay me any attention. But the second I leave Blue Sky, they call me in for an interview. And I think there's something suspect about any position that like hires you like in the first interview. I'm like, I never trust it. I saw that on Twitter or something recently, like where people were like, yep, if they hire you the same day. Mm -mm. Exactly. And so I come in for my first day. It was it's it was basically like a receptionist, but it was very close to like a runner position for um a special effects studio. If any of you don't know, you're basically like a gopher. And at that point, I was like now spoiled because at Blue Sky I didn't have to do anything like this. So I'm pretty sure they just like observed the way I worked that day. Yeah. And I just wish someone had pulled me to the side, but they waited until I left to send me an email being like, you know, you don't have to come back in for like ever like you know <laughs> what, what were you doing were you too slow or something like i wasn't i think i was just really like checked out you know okay. i was on my phone a couple times i'm not gonna deny that mm -hmm. um i did what they asked me to which was like full like the coffee brew coffee a couple times run the dishwasher sort the mail like you know i did all that but i was like hmm so <laughs> I was like, dang, just like one day, like no one was going to pull me to the side or talk to me after like, you know, whatever. So it's fine. Yeah, I wasn't supposed to be there anyway. Mm -hmm. um, so what are we getting to? Things that I've done after Blue Sky stuff. Um, one project at Netflix I was working on ended up being temporarily shelved for like rewrites. Mm -hmm. So that film probably would have been coming out like late 2020. It's still greenlit, so I think maybe we will go back to it. Mm -hmm. But I'm now on a different film with the same director, who's Mark Osborne. He was um, co-director of Kung Fu Panda. Mm -hmm. I'm working on a new film with him. I am not sure. I should have confirmed if it's been publicly announced. I don't know. <laughs> but we are working on that, and I believe that film is to come out like late 23. I'm crossing fingers we will roll back to the first movie because then it means I have a job for a couple more years. I don't have to worry yeah. about it, you know? Right. Um, in between both of those, which is like essentially during COVID, has this been announced? I don't know. Um, <laughs> yeah, again, I should have checked. The life I, of the animation industry. Yeah, because I don't, you know? So I worked on another feature film, which I can say is like very wacky <laughs> it's a musical and mm -hmm. it involves like pets and working on that production like every day I was like this is just wild <laughs> this is just wild and I just want it to be out into the world to see like mm -hmm. the world's commentary and how yeah how they receive it but I will say that the current film I'm on with Mark it's so inspirational because like if you remember the way that you felt when Into the Spider-Verse came out and mm -hmm. you saw it and you're like, wow, they're pushing the medium of the animation. They're pushing the technology very far. They're treating it like, you know, like materials and not using it as this, what we've all become accustomed to, like this plastic look. Yeah. So this current film is leaning into like a more artistic approach. So something that you would see in a museum. Mm -hmm. And I'm learning so much about like how they're trying to push the technology to achieve this visual style. And I mean, I'm really hoping, Ferdinand was Oscar nominated. So it's like, okay, I worked on an Oscar nom thing. Mm -hmm. However, I would be so proud when this film gets its Oscar nod. Cause it's, yeah. I, I really anticipate it being very beautiful. Mm -hmm. And like, I'll, I'll like compare it slightly to like Miyazaki things, you know, how it's like yeah. such a nice like visual experience. So. Yeah. It's, it's a little challenging because I don't know how we're going to get there, but yeah. like it's becoming so far a pretty good journey. So more, more things. <laughs> so, um, uh, so when we talk about diversity in the industry, um, there are things, some things that people don't consider. So, you know, you had to kind of quit a previous position because of your commute. The reason I moved to LA, um, was because I spent five and a half years driving 110 miles a day <laughs> and I couldn't find another job in Louisiana. So what are some things, um, and we can probably go back and forth of like things people should consider when giving opportunities to people 
uh, that they don't think out of outside of just giving them the opportunity. <laughs> yeah, the um the freaking like pay salary, you know, mm -hmm. and I I will say it at Blue Sky, my starting salary was like thirty two, thirty two thousand, mm -hmm. and with that my monthly commute expenses was easily like a little more than $500, but my biweekly check was like 800 and change. Mm -hmm. So it's like, okay, well, how am I even supposed to save to move? Because in New York, they want first month, they want the deposit to move in. And then you also had like a broker fee. Mm -hmm. So I'm supposed to try and save up almost like $2,000. And I'm like, where? Where? <laughs> Out of like $300 left, like, you know, whatever. Um, and so what would have been helpful for that particular situation, honestly, is if they had like a couple houses. Mm -hmm. So you're bringing in entry level people and like we can be in this house until we could get on our feet to right. actually get our own place. Something like that would have been dope. Wishful thinking. But I mean, we're learning that businesses do weird stuff like that anyway. So mm -hmm. um, something like that, like people want to constantly like reach out. Like I'm using Blue Sky as, because that's what I know. And I've mm -hmm. heard of some surrounding conversations, but it's like, how was the studio existing in Connecticut? and didn't have enough people from the tri-state area working in there, especially when they had schools. And maybe, you know, yeah, I went to SVA, that's an exception, but they mm -hmm. still should have had more SVA students. They should have had NYU students. They should have had even some community college or just like state college people mm -hmm. working at that studio. How come everybody was coming from international or West Coast, you know? Right. So I think they could have done a bit more community work and community engagement and really from starting at younger, like high school would have been dope, but sometimes that's like too late. Yeah. If they had done junior high, like, hey, we exist and we're just above the Bronx. That seems very accessible because like mm -hmm. I didn't really know that until I knew that, you know? Right. So, um, yeah, they don't like the salary. And it's just such a weird thing because like they can't afford to pay more. But like the marketing budget and like the budget for a lot of other things, I'm like, mm, okay, sure. Um, a lot of other things that isn't thought about when it comes to diversity is really that like uh, work culture or work environment mm -hmm. <laughs> because I uh, have natural hair, mm -hmm. but I also change my hair a lot. My mm -hmm. hair sometimes is an accessory. So you might see me with different color hair, braided mm -hmm. styles or whatever. So I think it's not also solely about being like politically correct, but just like if people are constantly the only one in a space, it's just so tiring. It's yeah. so tiring about just like how you have to kind of make sure you present yourself, the unnecessary burden of like, I'm representing my race and my yeah. gender stuff. And, and also, particularly because a lot of people are introverts. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. And like I had received some comments about like me coming off as like me and everyone that knew me was like, what? And I was like, yeah. And it's just like, well, you're just quiet. I was like, so why would you project me being mean if you've mm -hmm. never interacted with me and you can attest to the fact that I'm just quiet? Like, right. that, you know, I'm not. I can I be mean? Probably if I'm provoked, <laughs> right? But I'm I'm just by nature a quiet person. Um, but what I was I've had that too. Where, like I've had it where a coworker who I was friends with was like, "Oh, Deborah, you're mean." I was like, "Have I ever been mean to you? No. Have I ever? Have you ever seen me be mean to someone else? No. Then <laughs> all my mean." Yeah, I'm just quiet, you know. And and they also commented like I wouldn't like hang out, but I was <sighs> like. If, if I don't leave at 5.30, I will not get home until 9 o'clock. Right. You know, so I cannot hang out after work. And I worked through my lunch break so I could leave early. So I really didn't have much time to socialize except for the fact that I actually got to work an hour early. Because if I didn't leave my house at 6, I will not get to work until 10. Mm -hmm. It just, <laughs> you know, so it, it, it was hard. Um, but I also want to just say that I experienced some microaggressions there because I was also constantly the only person people were interacting with like myself. So mm -hmm. they didn't always mean to be like ignorant with the things they're just saying, but it's like, damn, maybe 
also if there weren't some other people like myself here, I wouldn't feel like I'm the only one constantly receiving this. Like not, I wouldn't want to share it, but at least I wouldn't be the only one at the same time, you know? Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I think those two things come to my really salary, man, because, um, and yeah, and, and just like the, sometimes the price point of things, it's like you want, this is going off from the industry studio wise, but I'm speaking mm -hmm. personal experience with like events. Like people say, well, we want more of like these kind of people to attend our stuff, but they still don't really make it accessible to those type of people. Right. Yeah. So like an opportunity has been presented to me. I'm speaking, try, trying to be as like indiscreet or discreet as possible. Mm -hmm. And the, just the time of the event is just so, I would say, unfortunate because like I cannot um <laughs> just give my funds to participate in this weekend as much yeah. as it's a good opportunity and stuff like that and they're thinking they're being like diverse and bring on diverse people yeah. but I I think their scope was still pretty selfish and limited in when they're actually you know having this thing so it's almost to a certain extent with like recruiters, like, yeah, well, we're reaching out to these sort of people and yeah. we're not saying that you should like lower the bar, but mm -hmm. the hoops that you're putting these groups of people that you claim that you want, it's just, it doesn't, it doesn't really make sense. Yeah. Um. So going back to what you said about hanging out with them for me particularly when I worked at my last position in Louisiana like it was the same thing like I am not gonna stay here. first of all I get here early so I can leave early so I can beat traffic and then if I stay for the event I have to stay two hours and do nothing like because I leave two hours before this event is gonna start two or three hours before this event is gonna start and then at that place and another place People don't get creative how we hang out. Like, I don't drink. And y'all always go on a happy hour. Like, I don't want to go to happy hour. Like, <laughs> like be creative at least if we're going to yeah. go out. Or I don't want to hang out with y'all. <laughs> it's just as simple as that. Like, y'all are my coworkers. Yeah, that's cool. Like. Uh, I don't want to be family. Like that's hilarious. <laughs> at least not with y'all. Like I don't mind a happy hour, but what good is drinking if you still gotta like commute for three hours you're gonna be on the train you're gonna be underground you're gonna be on a bus like what if I have to use the bathroom what's gonna happen like no and that's happened before I got because you again I know my subway station so I'm like okay if I have to get off of here I know that there's like a Marshalls I could use their restroom I don't want to go through that <laughs> you know so yeah you got a pre-plan it's like a whole event to just go to something after work yeah and then um, when you were talking about like uh, much earlier, like reaching out earlier to uh, to people, um, that's what I um, was saying. Like when in my video in response to the uh, diversity, the woman, the gender study that uh, women in animation in Hannenberg did, because it's like all of it was at the company level. And I'm like, y'all not really trying because <laughs> like. <laughs> That's going to be like two people that you're concentrating at the company level of like, oh, how can we get diversity like to the people who already decided that they were going to do this, which is few people like you got to get more people to want to do this. And like, OK, you create this affinity group for two people. Wow. That was a diversity. <laughs> yeah, and I'm not even crazy about that study because I feel like they should have gone deeper into like the race breakdown. Because mm -hmm. like, isn't it just like white and like non-white women, or like maybe the non-white women they go like Asian or something? Like I, I felt like they should have been still a bit more granular. Mm -hmm. Because I need to know what the numbers are for like black women, yeah, specifically. So. Yeah, and then um, another way that people don't think about, which, you know, we all complain about is unpaid internships. Like, I never had an internship in college because I was like, who going to pay for it? Like, how, where am I going to stay? Like, I live, I'm from Michigan. <laughs> I don't know, like, a lot of my families in Michigan, like, they're, I have a huge family and some of them are, like, other places, but also, like, the way my personality was set up, I'm like, I know they family, but I still don't know them. <laughs> <laughs> 
I don't, I don't want to talk to them. Like I've come a long way in communication. I like, cause even when I was like selling chocolate or something for the basketball team, I'd be like, I don't want to call my aunt or uncle <laughs> like, to have them buy this. Cause I don't want to talk on the phone, but like, even with like unpaid interests, I'm like, I always thought about, cause I, was, I also wanted to like study abroad in England in college. And I'm like, but how am I going to pay for it? Yes. Yes. <laughs> so that's like another thing where that's why sometimes rich people get opportunities because they can pay to stay oh, and do an unpaid internship. <laughs> yeah. So um, what do you feel like has been the biggest breakthrough in your career or do you feel like you're waiting for a big breakthrough or? <laughs> I don't know. The biggest, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, the biggest breakthrough, I would say that I've experienced yet. I don't know because sometimes I still feel like I'm so new still. Mm -hmm. Like I guess I've been in the industry like six years or something, something mm -hmm. like that. And it's longer than some people I know, but still is very, very new. Mm -hmm. So I think that's such a great question of, breakthrough you know I would say that like my whole journey in the industry or like my life after college mm -hmm. despite being an introvert I'm like pretty good at like internet networking I would say mm -hmm. and like just kind of naturally building connections and I'm not afraid to like shoot my professional shot which I think you can relate to yeah so I think my breakthrough is still on its way Mm -hmm. But what feels really good is like with the things that I'm doing, I feel genuinely supported by like the appropriate people. You know, mm -hmm. a lot of times when we are content creators or artists, you look to like your friends and family to support you. But like that's not like your target, really. They're just right. the people that know you. Yeah. So it's nice to have people that actually are like interested mm -hmm. in this sort of nerdy stuff that I do and like my animation or whatever space and people want to like help and support and connect me to other people, panelists for diverse tunes mm -hmm. or like I'm working on a personal project. Maybe we'll get into that. Maybe we won't. Mm -hmm. But when I mention it to people, they'll be like, oh, well, like, you know, you can ask me for advice when you get to this point. I'll be happy mm -hmm. to help you. And I, I think I don't know how much of a career breakthrough that is as opposed to like a personal yeah. So yeah, I think I'm still waiting on the career part. Mm -hmm. But I'm enjoying I'm enjoying my journey for the most part now. I'm I'm enjoying it. Um how, uh we kind of touched on this a little bit, but how has uh like being black or any other ism like being a woman or anything else impacted you in your animation career in any way like, you know, being black like a pred predominantly white male industry? Has your background like been a spotlight or? Like yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so um, when on Spies in Disguise, because the, well, the alleged main character is a black man. <laughs> um, there was a moment, I believe you, you've you had Matt, Munn, and mm -hmm. Jay Rodriguez on your channel mm -hmm. before. There was a moment where like us and like, three or four other black people were all in like one conference room. We're all like, why they got us all in here? <laughs> like, you know, it was like the black thought. It was like, as you see in those movies, the, um, the, what's it, the core, whatever the thing that they do, you know, when mm -hmm. they want to get like, whatever. And so that was like quite interesting. Some like a focus group, group or something? Focus group. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's kind of it. So I can't even remember what they wanted to check before. Um, but uh, oftentimes, at least on feature, they would ask for like feedback when they do screenings and screenings is essentially like getting a rough actual visual view of the visual view. I think that's redundant, <laughs> but still um, getting a view of the movie. Mm -hmm. And I just remember like, you know, I, at one point in the very beginning, I felt like this Lance character sounded like Samuel L. Jackson. I was like, not the word for word, but like it felt very like jive turkey, like 70s stuff. Oh, and yeah. yeah. And for me, it was just so evident that like the writer's room doesn't have anyone who this is their lived experience <laughs> contributing to the script. Mm -hmm. So that's why they created this focus group meeting where they like brought us all in and like having us like be real and tell us thoughts and whatever and I was kind of just like this is weird 
<laughs> um, and so there's sometimes with the microaggressions that I was facing, I would wonder like, is it because I'm black? Is it because I'm a woman? Is it because- Being a double minority, it'd be like, I don't know yeah. why. <laughs> People didn't even, which was so interesting. My closest friend at Blue Sky, we always joked about the fact that like, we're both Latinas, but she's a white Latina despite actually having a like brown or black mother really. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm a black Latina and nobody would ever approach us so, uh, with that assumption, you know? Mm -hmm. So we would be able to fly under the radar in that regards. But, um, mm -hmm. but yeah, so just getting back to it, sometimes what we both felt like, cause we went to film school and we're like very passionate about animation. So sometimes we were wondering if just like our knowledge was like threatening some of our like upper management people because like, mm -hmm. who are we to know this much? We just knew in the industry, you know, whatever type of stuff like that. Like we all got a whole degree. <laughs> yeah. And even we could have basically had two degrees with how obsessed we are, like, you know, so whatever. Um, what was the second part of your question? Um, did it did uh, just like have it like any isms affected you, impacted you in oh, your career? Oh, yes. And yeah. So what I will say is that after Blue Sky, I did decide that I didn't want to do as much code switching. Mm -hmm. So as I came into Netflix, um, I was just trying to, and I should say that Netflix, we were the only like East Coast animated uh, production happening at that time. I think it's still true. So I was in person, but I was still feeling a bit awkward, like warming up to people. Mm -hmm. And I actually feel like with um, moving virtually, I've become even more authentic, if you will. Mm -hmm. But it was like my goal with this new studio opportunity just to like constantly bring more of myself mm -hmm. into the meetings, into my interactions with people. So, yeah, I reduced the code switching like a lot. I can How still... do you feel like you were code switching? Oh, well, I would like first off, I would just barely speak. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um I wouldn't use any, so I like, I wouldn't talk to them like I'm talking to you, basically. Mm -hmm. I just wouldn't do it. Mm -hmm. um, if people were asking me like any of my interests, I wouldn't really be completely truthful with it. Um, I wouldn't really always want to share my stuff. And I even felt like, and maybe you can tell if you listen to like the first season of my podcast, mm -hmm. it's still very like a little bit more safer, you know, mm -hmm. in these last, this last season, I've definitely grown and just felt like even more comfortable with myself being a black person, a black woman, mm -hmm. and not feeling like I can't do certain mannerisms or like expressions. Um, so yeah, now, I don't know. I even said something in a movie and my coworker was like joking at me because like, it, you can just tell I had like no guard, like, you know, I don't know what I said. It was like some sort of sound effect or I was like, I don't know, mm -hmm. but yeah, so, and he's like this white guy from Jersey who's been around black people. So I think that's also why it was funny because <laughs> we also worked in the studio together in the office and like I was never like this. <laughs> so he's getting more authentic and like real Monique. Yeah, nice. Um, is there a story, whether it's about your career, animation, personal, that you've never gotten to talk about in interviews? Oh you really shoot! Like about. You know what's ha probably I don't know. I may have talked about this personally, but what's always kind of really dope is like being able to work alongside or with people that's worked on things that you like adored as a child. Mm -hmm. Like learning that someone was like a junior artist on The Lion King. I was like, ah, tell me more. What was it <laughs> like? You know? And it's just like, yeah, you fangirl a little bit, but like you know, some of it wears off, but it's just always very exciting. Like I learned um, this year, yeah, that like my producer at the moment was some sort of supervisor on Space Jam. So they were saying that like, oh, whatever, whatever their Space Jam experience was like, they were saying that it wasn't as good as like, who's Roger Rabbit? Mm -hmm. And I was like, well, first of all, it was like my Roger Rabbit. Okay, <laughs> I think it was pretty amazing. So the, um, the director, I think he was like in college at the time. So they uh -huh. were like, how old were you when Space Jam came out? And I was like, I was seven. <laughs> <It's> seven <laughs> right? So they're like, of course it was like your Roger Rabbit, you know? But mm -hmm. it's been so interesting just being able to be like, oh, I actually like know this person that worked on this thing. And like, I don't, 
I don't take that for granted. I don't also like put them up on a pedestal because of that. They're still humans. Mm -hmm. And um, it's just been like really, really cool having having those experiences and connections. I'm trying to think if there's oh, something I haven't talked about, which I've been learning happens very, very common on movies, is that like you accidentally delete <laughs> chunks of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so definitely when I first started at Blue Sky and I was learning to do things in the story department, I like accidentally wrote, overwrote so many files. <laughs> and I was just like, well, I hope, <laughs> I hope nobody needs the originals because they're gone. It was just so confusing. The, one, the girl who trained me was like, save files here and save files there and then copy from A to B. I don't know. And I dragged and dropped in the wrong place. And I did it a lot for a lot of files. So I don't think I've shared that in an interview. But there's always a people that just delete stuff. So I don't know. I think I did it for Ice Age and Ferdinand as I was like learning. So that's funny. <laughs> <laughs> it was storyboards, but still, if they ever were like, what was that storyboard sequence from like whenever? It like, and it's like, oh, I don't know. <laughs> I can't find it. <laughs> this is what I see. I don't know. I don't know. So yeah. Well, the studio doesn't exist anymore. So whatever. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you love about animation? Oh, my favorite, my favorite thing about animation is like the magical feeling that it could bring. I feel like <clears throat> a lot of my favorite movies always have that like element of like, like actual fantasy and like magic. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not and have never really been interested in the animation that's like too close to emulating like real life. Mm -hmm. um, I want them to push the boundaries. I want to feel like I'm traveling to like a different world. Um, I just love the fact, like, cause it's like to a certain extent, if you're not going to push boundaries and why is it even animated? Why couldn't you just do it yeah. live action, you know? Right. So that's how, that's probably what I love, like the, the most about it. Just, yeah, just pushing, pushing the limit. Yeah. Um, so what are the, what are some of the challenges in your specialty, which is like production, right? Uh, what are some of the challenges in your specialty or in working on certain projects that people might not know about? Yeah, so <laughs> one of the projects that I can't, couldn't talk about, <laughs> it was challenging on that because the film had three directors, three. Mm. Um, one of the directors co-wrote the script with a producer. Mm -hmm. And the producer was kind of like a fourth director who basically vetoed everything all the time. Mm. So it was very hard to like get things approved and being able to move things along when the three directors down here kind of felt like things were solid. Mm -hmm. And then the producer would be like, hold up, why don't you try this or actually change that? It's like, well, is this movie really going to come out? Or are we just gonna keep you know working on it forever? Right. Um, that was that was a little bit difficult, and I was on that film. I think starting like last summer, which I probably shouldn't say that much detail. But, <laughs> um, navigating uh, working virtually, the pandemic, time mm -hmm. zones, different things. I found myself. I ended up having to go to therapy just to be able to try and manage like the separation of like work and home when you're yeah. working at home. But I had to really show up a lot emotionally for the people on my team. Mm -hmm. I think as a coordinator, um, maybe people just look at each other as just coworkers at the same time as what you're saying. Like, I don't want to be family. Mm -hmm. But I feel like as a production coordinator, as any sort of production management person, you have to have some empathy with your mm -hmm. team because how are they, they need to be good to continue doing their job so like yeah. you know we can continue meeting our deadlines so if you're starting to see well someone could be sliding a little bit or like could be off i think it's important to check in with them so now in my current production i'm in the art department which mm -hmm. is completely new to me <clears throat> a lot harder to wrangle than some other departments and something that's been slightly challenging for me 
personally is just getting a grasp like on schedules, like spreadsheets. Mm -hmm. I've never been a spreadsheet person, like real spreadsheet person. Um, so I'm trying and I'm learning with that. And I think some of the oversight with production management is just like, just how much we are doing behind the scenes to make sure the artist can do their creative process smoothly and not be boggled down with a lot of the other things. Yeah. So, yeah. And again, just that personal, I try to do like every couple months, one-on-ones with people. Again, really because we're all virtual, so make it personal. Yeah. But also just to do like, almost like a wellness check. Like, oh, so how are you? Like, are you good? Like maybe you should try and take like a day off or something. Like I know we have deadlines, but like, you might just need a break. You might need rest, you know, yeah. just like everybody else. So mm -hmm. just managing all that stuff. Nice. Um, what was the podcast you did before Simply Robotics? I still don't talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> I still don't. Um, and it's part of my, like, my, my, like, separation. Like, mm. I'm a person. You're, like, divorced? <laughs> no, 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 no. Okay. I'm, I'm a person that, like, is from a very young age when we started having like uh, internet, social media, stuff like that, I knew that I wanted like a professional presence and like mm -hmm. a personal mm -hmm. thing too. So I really don't talk about that other podcast because that was still so personal, even though it's over. Mm -hmm. um, and I also just feel like if I talk about it, then everybody's gonna find like my personal social media and like boundaries. So <laughs> um, if you feel that the Simply Robotic stuff is still personable, that's wonderful because that's my intention. Yeah. But I can just tell you that other podcast was like a social commentary. Mm -hmm. I did it with my best friend at the time. And we were just talking about navigating the late, the later part of our twenties, being black women, um, living in a major city and just like, a lot of personal issues and stuff like that. At yeah. some points, we're basically taking topics from Twitter, but expanding upon them, like actually making a constructive conversation around them. Yeah. But um, no one has asked me that before, so go, Debra. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, um, what is the satisfaction you get from working in the industry versus? doing Simply Robotics versus doing Diverse Tunes. Oh, like, what is yeah. the difference? The difference. Diverse Tunes has been satisfying in the fact that, like, watching people connect because of what, what we're doing. Mm -hmm. Watching people, like, discover one another and go forth, you know, and people feeling like they've been able to also find resources, which is what we're big, big on, for navigating their careers or what have you. Um, the satisfaction of doing Simply Robotics is just like, it's just mine. Like it doesn't, I don't report to anyone. I'm constantly like, and you could probably relate to as like a content creator, just trying to figure out like new ways to kind of execute your work and present it and um, just like what you're doing. Cause it was a blog for so long before it became a podcast. And now the podcast kind of eliminated the blogs that I used to do. So I'm just like, I don't know what to do with the site besides to put my podcast on it right now, you know? Mm -hmm. But um, I, I tried this new thing where I did, uh, which was crazy for me, weekly, basically episode reviews of the Marvel What If series. Mm -hmm. I've never done a review like that, like in real time. Um, so that was a learning experience. I think if I were ever to acquire some support, <laughs> maybe it could come back. Mm -hmm. But it's definitely also got my wheels turning for like, well, how can I pivot that so I could talk about shows or series more often and not solo talk or, or only talk. I think the word I want to say is solely <laughs> talk mm -hmm. about feature films and stuff like that. Um, and I got to do more interviews this past year due to sponsorship. So that was a nice element to have. And that sponsorship kind of forced me to have to come up with a interview structure, which mm -hmm. I had been struggling with before. And um, I really liked how all those interviews turned out too. Um, and then the satisfaction from working in the industry is just really from like the knowledge that I'm getting mm -hmm. and how I can take that and apply that to like the personal short projects that I want to do. Um, 
And I don't feel, because I've been asked this before, like I'm missing out by not being an artist professionally. Mm -hmm. It's completely fine for me. Again, I like the fact that I'm learning so much. And then I could even pass that knowledge on to other people as, you know, it may be needed. Yeah. Um, so how have you been able to team up with um, Autodesk and Comic-Con? Like, uh, what kind of partnerships are each of them in? Yeah, Comic-Con found us, which was really dope. Um, mm -hmm. They slid in our DMs and was like, hey, you should submit a panel. And we did that. And I'm really grateful that they really enjoyed the panel that we did because they just kept asking us to do more panels and more conversations. And, and it's been a really, really dope experience. Cross fingers, more people would be like, hey, we want to work with y'all too because we saw y'all work with Comic-Con. Not yet. Um, <laughs> right? The Autodesk uh, partnership, I feel like came out of that whole thing that happened uh, 2020 with Black mm -hmm. Lives Matters. Yeah. And they had already been supporting content creators and were just trying to figure out different niches where they could continue to support. So they didn't really tap too much into podcasts. So um, they reached out to me and which was great is I didn't have to actually promote any software or anything. I wasn't like, hey, I got a discount code, whatever link. They were just mm -hmm. like, just say we sponsored this episode. And at the bare minimum, it just had to cover diversity in some capacity. Okay. So I really appreciated having that much freedom with it. Crossing my fingers, um, <laughs> we'll be able to partner, partner again because uh, I completed the sponsorship for them. Nice. Mm -hmm. um, so what is... Well, let's do this first. Can you talk about uh, how you decided to do an animated documentary and like, how is that going? Yeah, thanks. So that's the short uh, passion project that I'm doing. And I love film festivals, like working or interning that film festival very, very much like opened my eyes to like the kind of things that you can create because, mm -hmm. um, where was I coming from with that? I had, by going to SVA, we get so many studios coming to talk to us and giving us like kind of the same conversation. And I just found myself getting a little like, mm, I don't want to do this kind of stuff only to work at Blue Sky Rate. <laughs> um, but with film festivals, you get to see like a lot of experimental and I found like edgy and really intriguing work. So I have been watching some stuff I did in 2019, like a, uh, what was it called? A hundred day project. Mm -hmm. So I tried for a hundred days. I think I only did 50 days of stop motion. And from doing those 50 days, I think over six months too, I had that mm -hmm. <laughs> very long 50 days. Um, <laughs> I was like, what if I actually did like a consistent or consecutive cohesive stop motion project? So I was like, hmm, well, what would be the subject? And I found, or like in reflection, I'm really attracted to animated documentaries. Like mm -hmm. I really like kind of the rawness of the people's voices and the films themselves aren't always super polished. So mm -hmm. a lot of my favorite films have kind of fit in that realm. So I was like, okay, well, like I want to do an animated documentary then. And of course, stop motion, completely out of my comfort zone, don't know what I'm doing, whatever. And mm -hmm. then I was like, well, what's the subject going to be? And so, yeah, I just kept like thinking, thinking and, you know, having conversations with friends. I was like, I think I just wanted to be about Black millennials and um, hoping, I still have a couple more people to interview, mm -hmm. but I want to be able to piece an actual narrative together by the responses and the things that were that they've said in their their stuff. So it's still black millennials don't know what the sub topic or whatever would be, mm -hmm. but it's going slowly. <laughs> um, I will be taking a little break from my podcast so that I can move things forward with it. Mm -hmm. And I have to figure out how I'm gonna juggle all those things that you said and making a short film. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Best of luck. I look forward to watching it. Yeah, and like, I don't know how many years. <laughs> no, no, hopefully, you know, I could do some sort of crowdfunding and get mm -hmm. people to come on board and help and, you yeah, know, figure out a, a smart way of producing it, too. Cool. Um, 
So what is your goal with your Patreon? Yeah, you know, I've been thinking about that too. <laughs> <laughs> I've been thinking about that because I'll be feeling guilty. I'm like, um, I can tell if there's about to be a month where I'm not going to put out extra stuff. So mm -hmm. I like to let people know like, hey, I'm not charging you this month because I don't have the content I'm supposed to have, you know? Mm -hmm. But the goal really with the Patreon is that like, content creators we work very hard in what we're doing yeah and um i kind of would like a little source of income for some of these things so with the podcast i didn't completely want to put it behind a paywall i don't really believe in that so mm -hmm. what so enough people were like oh well you should do some video component so I'm like you know what that's extra work put it behind a the paywall then you know but you can still listen to the podcast anywhere but if you want to see it you can do that but i felt like what would be really interesting with the Patreon is to document my journey actually of making this short film mm -hmm. on there. So that's why I also want to take the break so that I can actually record the content, edit it, yeah. and be able to put it up there. Because even though I understand we don't see Black women, Black people, their behind the scenes process for the short films that come out, mm -hmm. um, and I want to be able to put that out there, I was just like, well, my journey, let's put it behind Patreon. And then maybe, not maybe, I can hire an editor to compile it into something that could be public facing. Yeah. So at the point, at this point, that's that's my intentions for. It. It's kind of like a behind the scenes, almost like a journal vlog type mm -hmm. of thing. So, yeah. Nice. Um so what have you learned throughout your life and career that would be beneficial advice to others? Oh, well, um, I think consistency, you know? Mm -hmm. um, enough people have told me that is it my resilience, my perseverance? Like I applied to Blue Sky, I keep bringing this up, but I, I applied to them so many times. Like mm -hmm. I went to like CTN, so I was over there in California slipping in my resume. They were doing whatever at SBA. I was constantly applying to them. But even though I was being rejected for a lot of those jobs, even after leaving them, I was still being rejected. I didn't give up on like animation. I said, okay, well, I'm gonna start blogging. Like I always went to film festivals. If I was going to like, you know, movie screenings or stuff like that and constantly just trying to be in the animation sphere and talking mm -hmm. about it so um you have to be like consistent i would say also be like authentic and true to yourself like mm -hmm. i got invited to the uh, spider-verse screening before it came out because i had talked about it so much and so mm -hmm. i was like this girl <laughs> should go because she won't <laughs> so you know being authentic <laughs> and and being consistent and you know, I know sometimes too, like people could, could be like, well, this is what I want to do and nothing's going to stop me from doing it and having like real tunnel vision. And it's not always about tunnel vision, right? I don't mm -hmm. think you should always say, well, since this doesn't work, like, I don't care what nobody else has to say. I'm just going to whatever. Mm -hmm. I think sometimes you do have to step back and see like how else you can look at approaching what your goal is, you know? Yeah that to be a little bit flexible in your your potential or possibly yeah, a potential journey to your end goal, you know? So yeah, it's not gonna look like whatever you thought. It just, it just isn't, man. <laughs> You're right. Right. Um, so what do you feel is the importance of incorporating your culture into projects when given opportunity? Man, I guess I'll go back to the Spider-Verse. Um, that was just so good because, I mean, it was <laughs> the closest I got to, like, seeing myself, even mm -hmm. though, you know, he was a boy. Yeah. But he was a uh, Spanish mom, right? Black dad. I was like, I feel that. <laughs> I feel it a lot. He was in New York City, always in Brooklyn, but, mm -hmm. you know, I was at Slide. <laughs> and I was just like, you know, I, I just really, really felt that. And um, something else I'll go back to in terms of like being able to relate. I, I talked about this movie too on my podcast called Chico and Rita. Yeah, and you always is... talk about Chico and Rita. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, I, I, that's why I want to watch it because of you mentioned Me, it. Because I talk about it all the time because <laughs> that was before Spider-Verse. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I cannot believe there are like black Spanish speaking people 
in an animated content right now for like 90 minutes. This is unbelievable. And um, it was just so great. I felt like I was watching my family. Mm -hmm. And even though like growing up as a child for some weird way, I didn't see race. So I thought I was like the Little Mermaid and I thought I was like Belle. I thought I was like Pocahontas and it's like, Monique, you were not like any of them. <laughs> but I didn't know that, you know? Yeah. But being able to then grow up and you, unfortunately in my adult age be like, oh, well, look at Princess Tiana who still should have had kinkier hair, but, you know, take it. Mm -hmm. um, Miles Morales is just like, well, these are cool, but everybody should have multiple people that they feel yeah. like they should look at to and be like, oh, well, that's like that side of my family or that's like that, that's like that, you know? Mm -hmm. And I kind of just think of like my friend who's um, Chinese and like, we were very excited with Mulan, you know? Mm -hmm. But then like, how long did it take before there was another yeah. Asian like Mulan? Cause you know, you mm -hmm. have Asian like Mulan, you have Asian like Aladdin. Mm -hmm. It shouldn't just be like one every X amount of years, it should yeah. really be like, I'm from New York. So it should be as diverse as New York is, I feel like. Yeah. Um, there's just too many people in the world for like most animated characters to only look like one kind of people. Mm -hmm. This is not an excuse. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, people can like take the obvious of, you know, you doing diverse tunes, but at the core, like, what have you decided is your purpose in regards to Blackness and Black professionals in animation? Me. Money? What have you decided? Okay. I'm sorry. Say that one more time. That what, was have really you decided? <laughs> <laughs> what have you decided is your purpose in regard to Blackness and Black professionals in animation? Hmm. I think my purpose is really not gatekeeping information. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah, I'm all about like access, pointing people if it's to your page, diverse tunes research page. There's like uh, other advocacy groups like Next mm -hmm. in Animation, mm -hmm. Asian Queens. There's so many. So pointing people to resources. And as I, one of the big reasons I moved into production management is because I felt like there weren't Black people really in those spaces. And mm -hmm. when it came down to producing and making animation outside of the creative part, people were being taken advantage. People mm -hmm. would be like, well, I spent all these hours doing all this work, but your work is not actually that good. And unfortunately no one told you that because you're reaching out to people like, pe not necessarily peers, but like kind of peers, friends and family mm -hmm. that don't really have the eye and understanding that this is, we're excited because your thing is moving, but your thing actually isn't at an industry quality. Right. And even, by saying industry quality, I don't solely mean like it needs to look like Disney Pixar, but even to a certain extent, film festivals is still like industry quality too. Yeah. So, but you don't have people to tell you that. Mm -hmm. So I'm all about like sharing and accessing like information. Even with that, I don't always do it freely. So a little shameless plug, I do offer consultation services mm -hmm. where like we can actually sit and talk about the nitty gritties of stuff, what kind of people you may need to help you achieve mm -hmm. if it's a pilot, a pitch or whatever for the animated project you're trying to get off the ground. So I think that's my purpose, just to be like my own version of the internet, just connecting <laughs> people, you know? Yeah. Connecting people with resources specifically. Yeah. Uh, so what do you hope for the future of animation as far as innovation, storylines, characters, et cetera? Oh, same thing as any other Black person I'd like to hope. <laughs> so um, continue pushing the medium forward. I mm -hmm. want to see more like creativity visually. Um, as far as storytelling, like I just want to see more diverse characters. Like I don't even solely need them to always be Black. Mm -hmm. But there's one thing to be like race, you know, that I believe sometimes this kicks my butt too. There's also ethnicity. Right. You know? So, okay, well, we cover a little Afro Latin person. Still a boy, don't have a girl. But Black people are not a monolith. So, right. where's like the West Indian people? Where's mm -hmm. from the continent? There's mm -hmm. also Black people that's in like the UK and all mm -hmm. sorts of stuff like that. It's, we need to get all of that. But within every race group, that same thing needs to happen too. So, we say like Asians, and well, okay, well, we always talk about China and Japan. Mm -hmm. There's those 
other Asian groups that's not being represented in their cultures. Right. So <clears throat> I'd hope for that in terms of like our stories and storytelling. And that reminds me of like Happily Ever After. Mm -hmm. I think it's on HBO Max. Definitely need to be, maybe that'll be my Saturday morning watch this time. Mm -hmm. um, I like what they were doing with with their approach to like diversity. Yeah. And um, the storytellers, we, it's not enough, which we've said before on your videos too, mm -hmm. to like have diversity at the entry level position. It needs yeah. to go all the way up. Right. And I just think it's, it's still just going to take some time because mm -hmm. those people are like of a certain age. So if you have people like me that are aspiring to be at those levels, we still got like 20 more years to go, I guess, <laughs> before we get there. <laughs> like, I don't know. We could start our own studios as much as we want, but if we don't have the knowledge, like how successful is it going to be, right, to be at those right. levels? So just, you know, I'm continuing to work my way up. So I don't know. Check back in like 15 years. Let's see where I'm <laughs> at. And we'll see what the diversity is looking at at the higher up positions. So what do you hope for the future? Wait, no. What do you hope um, black animation professionals do are doing in this current landscape um, that you are doing, like as far as, you know, having access to YouTube, uh, free or low cost, you know, software, like what do you hope black, it, it, to, like just, um, pretend that somebody's watching this and they think that they have to just pitch at a studio or they think that they have to do something. Like, what do you hope that they're doing that oh. they don't realize they can do? You all, um, it's it's kind of tricky because we do say like network across and, you mm -hmm. know, and connect with your peers and try and do joint projects. But I think we also see that like, if it's not your project, it's really hard to get people to commit to stay yeah. at things. Mm -hmm. So I guess with that, if you're going to collaborate with people, try and make it really short you know i think people yeah. mm -hmm. go for i don't know trying to make something that's eight minutes just immediately and maybe you can make a successful 30 or 60 minutes and you can actually get help to get you to that finish line mm -hmm. instead of the five minute ordeal mm -hmm. but 30 or 60 seconds oh just yeah i think that's what i meant <laughs> <laughs> yeah 30 or 60 seconds yeah. um so yeah you don't need to spend a lot of money in the mm -hmm. software I am definitely guilty of equipment. I do like to invest in equipment, but you don't mm -hmm. need to do that either. Doesn't mm -hmm. hurt, but it can hurt your pockets. <laughs> um, <laughs> so yeah, you can you can make really good stuff with just two to three people, probably mm -hmm. two people. Keep it short, and that would could that could if you do a bunch of those, I feel like something would gain traction. You know. Yeah. I don't think that's a bad way to, to look at it. And I feel like in me, basically having this two month sprint of like weekly podcasts, mm -hmm. it's kind of been interesting to see how that ebbs and flows, you know? Yeah. I'm gonna mm -hmm. try my hand at TikTok. Let's see what posting on TikTok will do with my episodes. <laughs> but it goes back to what I was saying about consistency. Pick, pick a consistency that is actually attainable and manageable, Yeah, you know? And so if you do like 30 seconds, you might be able to break down a production schedule that won't actually burn y'all out, but mm -hmm. still take y'all to the finish line, you know? Yeah, I'm sure there's been projects that existed before this, but when I saw the little, it was like the um, uh, Avatar The Last Airbender where these people got together and they did like a little thing where he was just twisting around and it was like, 10 seconds. And I was like, that's what people need to be doing. Yeah. Like, it was like six people, one was modeler, animation, VFX, and he just spent around in 3D for yeah. 10 seconds. And I'm like, somebody can get a job off that. And look, if you do that a couple times, you can switch yeah. up the people that you do it with. Mm -hmm. I think it's something worth considering for sure. Yeah. So last question. If someone was producing a documentary about you, what <laughs> things would you want them to highlight about your life outside of your work in animation? Um, definitely would have to highlight my family, mm -hmm. probably <laughs> my um, entertainment consumption, because <laughs> I am really into my cartoons. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. I'm very committed to Queen Latifah rom-coms. <laughs> it just is what it is. I also love Julia Roberts movies. <laughs> what do you feel about uh, 
was it the beginning of Taxi where it was like a skinny stunt double for Queen Latifah riding the bike? I think I have to rewatch that because I didn't know. <laughs> it was like I think it was Taxi where they, she was a bike messenger or something like that, mm -hmm. and she and it was like the beginning, like riding the bike through the city, and then it was oh, like that's the person funny. was like probably a dude and skinnier, <laughs> like, and then she like skirt and it's oh, like no. Latifa. <laughs> I have to rewatch that, but like yeah, so I think some of that is like kind of funny, um, and I watched bad reality TV because because. You know, judge me <laughs> right yeah um i think also in, in a documentary about me oh i would want them to talk with me a bit just about like life mm -hmm. and um going after the things that you want and <laughs> i'm also a very sensitive person mm -hmm. hashtag i'm a cancer so <laughs> um just kind of navigating when to detach and separate yourself and know that it's not about you and it's not you and like you know just yeah going through that type of thing and then also like therapy because i've said it earlier but like i've been in and out of therapy i realized for like 10 years mm -hmm. and uh it's become something more talked about now which yeah. is great I never even felt like ashamed about it. I just never felt it like, mattered to bring it up. Mm -hmm. But navigating going back and forth through therapy and sometimes going or to therapy when you don't necessarily always like need it, you yeah. know, you just like, I could just probably use someone to talk to that has nothing to do with the rest of my life, you know? And mm -hmm. and some very interesting have, things have come out of going when like, I don't feel like my life is in a crisis, you know? Right. So, um, yeah, I think some life philosophies and stuff like that could be cool. I would love, actually, though, to have, like, a little documentary about me. So. <laughs> in due time, in due time, I think I could have an interesting story if it's well edited. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So tell people how they can follow you on all the things. Yes, I put it right here. Mm -hmm. The barbs down um, at Simply Robotics on all social media platforms. The website is simplyrobotics.com. And if you're interested in consulting or contacting me, there's a nice page for that. So it's all cool because, you know, Instagram and Twitter kind of filters out your DMs if you're not really following the person. Yeah. Um, so that's the best way. And if for some reason you, you don't remember, you don't know how to do that, you can always reach out to Deborah. She would facilitate. <laughs> She's like, this is not my job, but fine, you know. I know um, how to contact her. <laughs> yeah, I think I think that's that's it. Oh, yeah, yeah. Even if you simplybox.com is like one-stop shop. So if you want to find out anything about diverse tunes, the podcast, it's all there. Mm -hmm. So thank you, Monique, for coming on my platform. It was a long time coming. I'm so happy for both of us. <laughs> oh, and I had Deborah on my show. Y'all might know this already, but you know, you can listen to Deborah's episode um, mm -hmm. on my podcast and enjoy it. Cool. And to everyone out there, I want you to like so I know it's real. Comment and tell me how you feel. Subscribe to Soda Deal and sign up for post notifications to show your zeal. And I'll see you in the next video.